come up with an expectation or the uh, derived allele uh, frequency uh, spectra. Okay, so this is kind of like our, our spectrum. Okay, so this is kind of the goal for this, uh, this lecture here. So, um, you know, can we come up with an expectation for how the derived allele frequency or an allele frequency spectra would look like? So the question is like, let's say we've, you know, sampled our DNA or sampled our genomes and we've, you know, uh, we've estimated a site frequency spectra for whichever portion we're analyzing, or maybe it's for the whole genome. So what do we expect this to be? Can we come up with an expectation? Now, to think about this, we're again going to think about trees. So let's, you know, let's, let's talk about, you know, uh, and fairly exact, you know, simple example. Let's say we again have uh, free gene copies. And again, we know that these free gene copies are going to have some sort of uh, genealogical relationship, let's say it looks something like this. And again, we know now a lot of the properties of this, uh, you know, these kinds of genealogical uh, relationships. We know that, you know, we know the expected time to this event. We know that that kind of event is, you know, it's going to take on average two and three generations. We actually know the expected time to the most recent common ancestor of all of these copies. So, you know, that's, and that's the total of uh, these two numbers. We know that these two gene copies on average will coalesce two in generations in the past. And so the total time to the most recent common ancestor is going to be you know, the sum of these. But we also know kind of the total tree space as well, right? So we know that you know, here we have a lot of tree space, not just you know, this many generations in the past, all of these gene copies will coalesce, but there's actually more generations within this tree. And that's very important as we kind of saw for estimating the number of segregating sites, because the more tree space we have, the more segregating sites we're, we're actually going to uh, have. And that's also, you know, that is also correlated with the number of mutations or the number of different mutations we actually see in the tree. And allele frequency spectra also has to do with uh, mutations. So again, here, you know, we can say that our total tree length, this is very simple. So we have two of these branches. So that's 2n times 2 plus, you know, we have three branches that are 2n free length. So that's, you know, 2n over 3 times 3. And so the total tree length for this uh, you know, kind of this relationship is 6n. We know that there's a total of 6n generations within this kind of genealogy. So there's, you know, 6n generations of time where different mutations uh, can accumulate. But let's now talk about the drive allele frequency spectra. So what would a drive allele frequency spectra for these three gene copies look like, okay? And in this case, we're only going to talk about the kind of segregating sites so drive. So if we have three gene copies, we actually have two bins. Well, we could have sites that have, you know, one copy of the mutant allele. And we're not really going to talk about non-polymorphic sites. We're only going to deal, for this case, with polymorphic sites. So if we have three gene copies, you know, uh, you know, a mutation could be present in, you know, one of those gene copies, or a mutation could be present in two of those gene copies, right? If the mutation is present in all three of those gene copies, that's common to all three of them, so that's not a segregated site. If it's, you know, absent from any of these gene copies, so that's, again, not a segregating site. For this case, we're, you know, when we're building the site frequency spectra, we're only going to be dealing with segregating sites. So these are our only options. So we could have, you know, sites that are present in only one individual or one third segregating, or we could have sites that are present in two individuals or two thirds segregating. So, um, so the, the, the question is when we're talking about an expectation here, what is the frequency? So frequency of you know, segregating sites. So we're trying to come up with an expectation of the frequency of this. Well, let, let's think about this uh, question. So let's Think about if we can come up with a frequency, you know, you know, how much, how many, what's the frequency we would actually observe one third, uh, you know, derived allele frequency. Well, this is, you know, it's not that hard to figure out that this actually has to do a lot with tree space. So actually tree space, um, 
try to correct that, you know, a bit bigger. So that's, um, so what we're, we're, we're talking about is, you know, one third sites with one third drive allele frequency. And this is going to be, you know, tree space producing one third, uh, you know, tree space producing mutations that are present in one third of uh, these genes over the total tree space. So the frequency of the drive alleles that are present one third in one third of these gene copies is just equal to this, the amount of tree space that produces one third drive allele frequencies over the total tree space. So let's try to figure this out here. So let's look at this region here. So where on this genealogy does a mutation need to happen that will give me one third drive allele frequency? Let's think about it. Let's say we put a mutation over here. What would happen if we had a mutation on this branch? Well, this mutation is going to be present in this gene copy and it's going to be present in the, this gene copy, but it's not going to be present here. So if a mutation happens here, that's going to give me two thirds, you know, the drive allele frequency is not going to be one third, but it's going to be two thirds because it's going to be, you know, present in two individuals and absent in one individual. So a mutation here doesn't actually work for this particle, particular drive allele frequency. But if I had a mutation here, well, then that would, you know, this gene copy would have a, you know, would have that drive allele, but this gene copy and this gene copy wouldn't have that drive allele. So that would actually give me a, you know, one third drive allele frequency uh, for that site. And similarly, if a mutation, and similarly, if a mutation kind of, uh, you know, happened here, here, it's again the same thing. We would have, you know, you know that mutant allele will be present here, but it won't be present in one of these gene copies. And again, if we have a mutation here, so, and a mutation anywhere along this branch, if we had a mutation here, that mutation would be in this gene copy, it would be absent from these, you know, and if we had, you know, again, if we had a mutation here, it's the same thing. If we have a mutation here, it's the same thing. If we have a mutation here, it's the same thing. So again, basically anywhere along this tree space, you know, in anywhere of these branches and this total branch, if a mutation happens, we're going to get a drive allele frequency of one third. So now we can actually calculate it because all we have to do is calculate the total amount of tree space that is made up of these branches that lead to a one third drive allele uh, frequency spectra. So we can actually figure this out. We can say, well, this is 2n, this branch space here, okay? And we have one of that. So if we had a mutation on this branch, this is also two n generations long. But if we had a mutation here, that would lead to a two thirds drive allele frequency. So that's two n plus what else? Well, I have one, two, three branches that are two n over three. So again, this is two n over three, uh, you know, times three over the total tree length, which is six n generations. So if we actually do this math we can see that we have two thirds. So we can actually say that the frequency of sites, given this genealogy, I would expect about two thirds of my segregating sites to have, you know, a drive allele frequency of one, uh, you know, one thirds. So we can say like, this is two over three and, you know, we can build this up like that. Okay, so we can actually now, you know, predict that. So given this genealogy, and given the relationship between you know, time to most recent common ancestry and the total tree length and the time to each coalescent event, we can actually figure out, you know, given these three gene copies, what's my expectation to having you know, the number of sites that have one third drive of real frequency. And we could do you know, this, a similar thing for uh, you know, the, the other frequency that we actually have. And the other one is of course, frequency of sites that have two thirds drive allele frequency. Well, again, it's the same logic. Where among this uh, tree space do I, you know, have to put my mutations that leads to a two third drive allele frequency? Well, there's actually only one place. It's this here. Let's do that in a different color so that it's not mixed up. So that's kind of here. So if I put a mutation anywhere along this branch here, in this, you know, this tree space here. If I put a mutation anywhere along here, that will lead to a two-third uh, drive allele frequency. But anywhere else on this tree space, I won't observe a two-third uh, 
uh, drive the linear frequency. So again, what's the you know branch length here? That's two n in generations. What's my total tree space? That's six n. So we can actually say that this is you know one third. So you know we're going to have one third of our sites within this genealogy is going to lead to a drive allele frequency of two out of three. Okay, so this is again very simple. So we've you know very simply just used all of our kind of knowledge and everything that we did up to this point to just very clearly show how we could come up with a, you know given a genealogy how we could come up with an expectation of what the site frequency spectra would look like for this uh, example but now let's let's again as we always like to do let's start complicating things a bit more and let's work with you know um you know the drive the little frequency spectra so again we're continuing with this so again, drived uh, allele uh, frequency spectrum. Okay, let's call this two, because you know, for a lack of like lame, naming it anything else, it's two because now we're going to increase kind of the number of gene copies that we have. Here we work with a free gene copies. Now let's uh, try to kind of visualize and predict this event when we have four gene copies. Okay, so. Um, Right, so let's do something like this. One, two, uh, three, uh, four. So we have now four gene copies. And again, what we have to do is we can assume a genealogical, genealogical relationship between these four gene copies. And again, let's just you know, assume that these, are, these two coalesce first, and then you know, this one could coalesce with the ancestor of those, and in the end, this one could coalesce with this, okay? So this is one, possible tree type, but I'm saying one possible tree type because this isn't how necessarily it can happen. It can also happen in different ways. Here, you don't really have any other tree topology. Again, you know, these two coalesce and then this one coalesces, or you could have, you could say that these two coalesce and then that one, but that would always lead to the same tree shape. So if you have three gene copies, you actually only have one tree shape or one possible kind of uh, genealogical topology. But if you have actually four gene copies, you can actually have another topology because we could actually say, okay, let's say we have four gene copies. So, you know, these two could again, let's say coalesce with each other, but then, you know, after a time, uh, then these two gene copies could coalesce with each other. And then, you know, this, you know, uh, you know would be uh, completed. So actually we have two different kind of uh, gene topologies. So again, we could just, uh, I'll fix that in a minute. So yeah. So again, we could yeah, kind of talk about this. And then of course the timing, you know, the time we have to wait for these events, that wouldn't change, but the, you know, the topology uh, of these things actually would. Let's do like that. That's, ooh, that's way off. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah. Assume that that's acceptable, okay. Anyways, all right, and then this is kind of like when they all call us with each other. Now again, so the three topologies, the important thing here is that we can actually have, you know, different uh, kind of topologies as we increase the number of, you know, number of gene copies. So as the number of gene copies kind of increases, the number of uh, kind of different topologies that we have to, to consider actually grows. And this is actually very important for the drive allele frequency, because remember, predicting the drive allele frequency is all about, you know, the consequences of mutations where along these branches, do I have a mutation that leads to one third drive the allele frequency where along this topology, I have, you know, a mutation that leads to two thirds. And of course, if the topology of the tree changes, you know, my expectations for these uh, drive the allele frequencies will again change. So if we have, you know, more than three gene copies, if we have four gene copies, we have to like kind of integrate two different tree spaces for getting the estimates of, you know, 
uh, the right allele uh, frequencies. So we can call this, you know, tree type one. And this could be, you know, tree type two. That could be a tree type two. So let's again look at the same thing. And again, we actually know the time. We know that this is 2n over six generations. This is going to be 2n over three generations. And this is going to be 2n generations. So those timings won't change but, you know, from our you know, previous um, kind of lectures. And again, the total tree space is again, not going to change. So we can calculate total tree length so total tree length for both of these trees, even though they have different topologies, the total tree length is not going to be different. It's going to be just 2n, you know, uh, 1 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 6, which is going to be, in this case, 3.33n generation. So again, even though topology is the same, the total tree length, the total amount of branches or total amount of generations in these genealogies, even though they have different topologies, is exactly the, uh, the same. So now let's start calculating our expectations for the drive allele frequency. And in this case, remember, when we had three gene copies, we had two possibilities, right? We could have a drive allele frequency of one third, we could have a drive allele frequency of two thirds. And in this case, what can we have? We can have a drive allele frequency of one fourth. So, you know, one out, you know, only one out of the four gene copies has that drive allele frequency. We could have a drive allele frequency of, you know, two fourths, only two gene copies out of the four have that drive allele. And we could have, you know, uh, three fourths, you know, three of those gene copies have the drive allele. And again, we're only talking about segregated sites. So if we have, you know, four copies of the mutant allele or the drive allele, that's not a segregating site. If we have no copies of the drive allele, again, that's not a segregating site. For this case, we're only looking at uh, segregating sites. So let's try to figure this out, okay? So we'll have to do this for this tree, and we'll have to do this for this tree uh, separately because their topology is different. Again, when we're talking about this tree topology here, where along this you know, tree must there be mutations for me to have you know, one fourth kind of drive the allele frequency. Well, you know, here in this branch here, this branch here, you know, anywhere along this branch and anywhere along this branch, you know, if we have mutations anywhere along this space, that will lead to a drive the allele frequency of one. Again, if we have mutation here, only this gene copy will have that, uh, you know, drive the allele, it will be absent here if we have it here. So again, all we have to do is actually sum up the total tree space that will lead to one fourth uh, drive allele frequency. So what did we say about that? Uh, we said, you know, let's talk about it. It's like, so I have one, two, three, four branches that are two and six in length. So we can do that. So two n over six times four, right? So I have, you know, if I have a mutation here on this branch, you know, th that mutation will be inherited by these two gene copies, so that won't give me a drive allele frequency of one fourth, but this branch here and this branch here. So I actually have two branches of length 2n over 3. So, you know, 2n over 3 times 2. Okay, and lastly, if I have, let's say, if I have a mutation here on this branch here, well, that, that's going to get inherited by this gene copy, by this gene copy, and by this gene copy. So it's not going to give me a drive allele frequency of one fourth. But if I have it in this branch here, that's only going to lead to a drive allele in this uh, kind of gene copy. So it's not going to be present here. So again, so this means I have like one branch that is 2n in length. And again, I have to divide that by the total tree space in generations, which is now 3n. And from here, we can say that this is about 0. 63. Okay, so that's uh, for this. So let's, you know, for this tree, calculate the, you know, the total, you know, the expectation for two fourths. Okay, so where along this tree uh, do I have to put a mutation so I have two over four? Uh, well, there's only one place actually here. So if I have mutations along this branch here, that's going to lead to a drive delivery frequency of two fourths. Anywhere else is not going to you know, result in a two-fourth drive allele frequency. So again, this is very simple. This is 
you know, we only have one branch, which is 2n, uh, you know, over 3 in length, over 7.33n, which is uh, equal to about 0 0.09, okay? So that's, that's my expectation for, you know, the drive allele frequency of, frequency of two fourths. So let's do this for three, three fourths. And where along this tree do I have to put a mutation? We talked about this, so it's right here. So if I, mutate, if I have a mutation on this branch here, that will lead to a drive allele frequency of three fourths. And anywhere else on this tree space, if I have a mutation, I'm not going to reach a uh, drive allele frequency of three fourths, okay? So again, so we can actually say we know the length of that, that's 2n, right? Okay, yeah, that's 2n over 3.33n, which is going to give us about 0 0.27, okay? So that's for this topology. Now let's try to do the same thing uh, for this, you know, for this topology here. So again, one fourth. So we're along this tree, um, can I put mutations that will lead to a drive the frequency of one fourth? Well, you know, anywhere along here would result in one fourth. If I have a mutation here, it's only going to be present in this, in this gene copy, absent here, if I have here, you know, vice versa. Um, you know, if I, let's say I put a mutation here, would that lead to a drive allele frequency of one fourth? Yeah, it would, because, you know, that's only going to be inherited by this gene copy. And again, here, so, you know, all along this space, but if I look at this space, yeah, these two branches, mutations in these two branches would lead to a drive allele frequency of one fourth. But if I put a mutation here, that's going to be two fourth. If I put a mutation here, that's again going to be two fourth. If I put a mutation here, it's going to be inherited by these two gene copies. So that's again going to lead to two fourth. So, you know, uh, the total tree space that leads to, you know, frequency of one fourth for this gene topology is all the space here. So that's four times, you know, two N over six, plus I have two here. Um, so that those are two N over three in length. So two N over three times two, and that's about it. You know, mutations here uh, is going to lead to two, four frequency. Mutations anywhere along these branches is again going to lead to, to two, four frequency. So again, this is, you know, divided by n. So this is going to give us about 0 0.36. And let's do 2 fourth. And we kind of went over this, you know, 2 fourth, if I have any mutations along the, this branch here is going to result in 2 fourth. Any mutations along this branch here is going to result in 2 fourth. So what is this? So we have one branch of 2n over 3 in length, or actually no, we have, yes, one branch of 2n over 3 in length plus we have two branches that are 2n in length. So 2n times 2 over 7.33n, and this is going to be about uh, 0.63, okay? And now let's look at, you know, branches producing 3 quarter or 3 fourth uh, drive alleles. Well, there is no space in this tree that's going to produce you know, uh, a three fourth um, drive allele frequency spectra because there's no way you can place a mutation along this branch that's going to be inherited by three copies, by three gene copies in this topology, okay? So now we've actually figured out for each of our three topologies, what's the expected kind of drive allele frequency is going to be, um, it's going to be for this, you know, for these, you know, for these run for, uh, gene copies. So how, how do I do this? So what do I do when I'm trying to figure out, you know, you know, the drive allele frequency total, like incorporating both of these topologies? Do, do I kind of like take an average of these? Do I just like, you know, average this and this, average of this and this, average of this and this, because this is kind of zero? Well, yeah, it, it kind of is. Of course, that's, that's, that's pretty, um, that's pretty much what we're going to do. But there's one other thing that we have to actually incorporate before taking, you know, kind of the average between these separate frequencies. And that's the probability of each tree. And what do we mean by the probability of each tree? So how probable it is that we observe any of these uh, tree topologies. Now, if you actually look carefully, there's, 
you know, two ways I can obtain this tree, but there's only one way I can obtain this tree. So let's look at it this way. If two, these two gene copies coalesce first, well, then I can have, you know, a gene coalescence with this gene, you know, and then later with this gene. But I could also have another probability where these two gene copies coalesce first, and then, you know, this one coalesces first with these two, and then this one. So if I run this one, two, three, four, you know, I could have an event where one and two coalesce, then three, and then four coalesces, or I could have one and two that coalesces, then four, then three. So I have two different ways of actually producing this tree. But where in this tree, I only have one way. If these two genes coalesce with each other, then I'm certain that these two have to coalesce with each other. Or if these two coalesce with each other, then these two are going to coalesce with each other. There's no other option. If, you know, the moment that one of, you know, two of these genes coalesce, to get this gene topology, then the other two have to coalesce with each other. Whereas in this case, you know, once these two, you know, any two gene copies coalesce, then I have two other ways of building that tree. So we can actually say that, you know, the probability of tree type, you know, uh, let's say probability of, um, yes, yeah, yeah, tree type one is equal to two thirds. Whereas, you know, in this case, the probability of tree type one is equal to one third, okay? So there's two ways of building this tree. So there's two probable ways that I can actually build this tree, but there's only one way that we can obtain this tree. So the probability of me kind of, of this genealogy, having this kind of a topology is actually higher than, you know, having this type of uh, topology, okay? So I have to actually factor that into when I'm calculating the uh, total, uh, you know, the kind of total expectation for these drive earlier frequencies. And let's actually do that. So let's now kind of calculate um, the total drive allele frequencies. I would expect, uh, you know, uh, in this sort of scenario. So what we actually have to do is, so let's go, you know, one fourth. So how do we do this? So we're just going to basically take the average of this, we, you know, one out of four, um, frequency of drive alleles could occur this way, or they could occur this way. So if we're talking about or in probability, we're talking about the summation. So what we actually have to do is we have to sum this number, 0 0.63, with, you know, this number here, 0 0.36. But when we're actually doing that, we have to incorporate the probabilities of observing that topology or observing that probability of a one-fourth drive allele. So in this case, this is going to be the probability of tree space one. So the probability of tree space one is two out of thirds, okay? And, and here, again, we have 0 0.36, and the probability of observing that tree space is one-third. So the total probability, you know, given four gene copies, of you know the frequency of in this tree space uh, of observing one you know sites with uh, one quarter drive alleles is going to be 0 0.54. Okay, and we can extend this logic to the rest of our uh, you know uh, to our frequency. So frequency of sites that have two out of four copies of the mutant allele. So that's again you know. Uh, the probability of tree space one, you know, tree one, 0 0.09 times, you know, the probability of observing that tree, and then 0 0.63 times the probability of observing that tree. So that will give us about 0 0.27. And lastly, we can do this for, uh, you know, three fourth direct alleles, which is again, you know, that probability 0 0.27 times the probability of the tree plus, you know, zero times the probability of the tree. So this is going to be 0 0.18. So now we have kind of expectations given for gene copies. We have an expectation to how the drive allele frequency will look like, how, you know, the number of, you know, how allele frequencies will segregate along uh, those four gene copies. So let's, let's now translate this. Okay, so let's translate this into a uh, site frequency spectrum. 
Um, so we have one quarter, um, two fourths, and and three fourths. Okay. So again, we can't have more than this because if we have you know four dried alleles, that's not a segregated site. If we have you know no copies of the dried allele, that's again not a segregated site. So let, let's see. One quarter. So we have about you know um, you know something like this. Let's draw that. So this is about 0 0.54. So we expect about more than half of the segregating sites within uh, these four gene copies to actually you know, carry one copy of the mutant allele. And we expect about you know, um, 0 0.27 uh, of those sites to actually carry two copies of the mutant allele. And we expect about um, you know, somewhere around 0.18% of those uh, sites, those segregating sites within this, you know, within these gene copies and within this tree space to carry about 0.18. Now there's, you know, it, it, and this is one of the great things about Colossus and Fury is that there's just this very nice and obvious relationship between this once you actually drive these expectations. And if you look carefully, the relationship is pretty obvious. And it, for me, it's pretty striking because if you look at it, this actually, this number here is half of this number here. So we can actually say that, you know, this is one half of 0 0.54, okay? And if you look at this, this is one third of 0 0.54. So this is one third of 0 0.54. And this is pretty remarkable because it gives us automatically a relationship or expectation for a drive allele frequency given a certain amount of gene copies that we've uh, sampled. And we can actually easily generalize this, right? We can generalize this. We can say, let's do this for n gene copies, right? Let's say we have a sample of n, n gene copies. And, you know, given what we've actually shown here, what we've actually, you know, shown there, we can now come up with an expectation of how the allele frequency spectrum would actually look like. So, you know, given n genes, we know that, you know, one over n, you know, two over n, uh, three over n, um, you know, four over n, you know, five over n, all the way dot, dot, dot to about, you know, n minus one over n, okay? So this is kind of like given n gene copies, this is how the site frequency spectrum would look like. You know, we can, you know, n minus one over n is the last kind of column. Again, think of it, you know, with four, if we had four drive alleles, that wouldn't be a segregating site. So we had no drive alleles, that wouldn't be a segregating site. But now we can actually, you know, come up with an expectation. We know that if this number is X, you know, uh, the second one is going to be X over two. Uh, you know, the third column is going to be X over three. The fourth column is going to be x over four. The fifth column is going to be x over five. And you know, the last column is going to be uh, basically you know, one over n minus one times x. So now actually, you know, given any number of gene copies, we can actually come up with an expectation of how the drug allele frequency will actually look like, how you know, gene copies are segregating within uh, our populations. And that's, again, a very kind of powerful and neat uh, kind of uh, way of looking at it, because now we have an expectation to how you know, variation is segregated along any number of uh, gene copies. Of course, all of this is within the right Fisher model. So within the right Fisher model, within that model that we've been building on. So remember the right Fisher model is kind of a population with constant population size that doesn't actually receive any migrants. There is no selection. So given all of those kind of assumptions, we can now, you know, given any number of gene copies, we can come up with how allele frequencies should actually be distributed between those gene copies. And we've also derived other expectations to like what the number of segregated sites should be among those gene copies and what, you know, uh, pi should be among those. So average number of nucleotide differences should be. So now we've actually kind of completed all the way and drive the expectations for this. So before we kind of leave off, so I have 10 more minutes, sorry about that, but let's just try to see, uh, like, let's try to put all of these together. There was a couple of other things that I wanted to touch on, but I'm not going to have time for them. So let's just quickly, you know, talk about Theta pi and theta s under um, 
you know, kind of the WF models under the Wright Fisher model and, um, you know, uh, some of their relationships, which is kind of important for a lot of the things you actually uh, do uh, prior. So let's, let's to wrap up, um, let's talk about theta pi uh, and theta s uh, in the Wright Fisher model, okay? So what we've actually shown here, you know, shown right here is that, you know, there, there's a very, you know, simple relationship between the drive, you know, expected drive delivery frequency. It's going to be like one, four, if we have two, four, if we have three, four, something like this, we know that this is going to be, you know, X, this is going to be X over two, and this is going to be X over three, okay? So now what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to, so this is the neutral expectation given for gene copies. This is how I would expect the you know, neutral allele frequency spectrum to look like. So let's now make a data set, okay? A data set that conforms to actually this, you know, one, four, two, four, and uh, three, you know, three quarters. So, you know, I'm just going to make up a data set. So this is going to be six. If that's six, this is going to be three. If that's three, this is going to be uh, two. So yeah, that's not very nice to scale, but it doesn't really matter. So we have like two drive allele frequencies. So this is the expectation. Now we've made a data set that conforms to this, and this conforms to neutrality. Now let's, let's look at this, you know, how we actually would look, you know, observe this in our data. So let's say we have, you know, collected data from two individuals, okay? We've collected data from two individuals, and we're looking at a certain, you know, uh, um, certain DNA segment. Okay, so this is individual one. Let's say this is individual two. So we're looking at a certain DNA segment within this individual. And now, you know, let's, let's you know, I'm going to now distribute variation along these uh, DNAs to actually confirm to this. So, you know, uh, how many segregating sites do I have? Again, I can look at my site frequency spectra and I can quickly understand how many segregating sites I have. I have a total of, you know, here we have six, we have five, you know, we have two segregating sites here, we have three segregating sites here, we have six here, so we have a total of 11 segregating sites. So one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, nine, 10, 11, so let's extend those. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start putting mutations on these branches that you know match whatever we observed there. So just going to quickly do that. So X's are drive alleles, so new kind of uh, mutations. Uh, there we go, and then now we have one there, we have one on seven, we have one on 10, we have one on 11. Um, we have one on three, we have one on four, we have one on seven. Okay. Oh, John, yes? can, you, can you do that with another color like red? We cannot yep. see the okay. sure. Thank you. Yep, yep, quickly. Is that better? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Just quickly doing that, but red. Okay, we have that. And then lastly, this is on two. We have it on six. We have it on eight. Okay, so that pretty much should do it. Let's extend that a bit more. Okay, so now we've I've actually tried to distribute these so that you know everything matches and we can quickly you know test that. So we need two sites that have three copies of the drive allele. So there's one site here that has three copies and another site here that has three copies. So that's two sites. We need you know, two sites that have two copies of the drive allele. So this site here, no, we, have, we need three sites. So this site here has two copies. This site here has two copies. This site here has two copies. And we need about six that have only one copy. So one site here, second site is here, third site, fourth site, um, fifth site and sixth site. Okay, so this is exactly matches 
that expectation here. So let's now go ahead and calculate our statistics. So let's calculate theta pi, okay? So what was theta pi? Theta pi is just average pairwise nucleotide differences between these gene copies. So if we label these, let's say this is A, this is B, this is C, and this is D, all I have to do is actually, you know, pairwise comparisons of, um, you know, if we're going theta pi, all we have to do is like, you know, A, B, A, C, you know, A, D, and then we have, you know, B, C, uh, B, D, and yeah, that's about it, right? We have A, B, A, C, A, D, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we have CD, yeah, sorry, I knew I was missing one there, okay? So we can actually quickly look at pairwise comparison. So what's, you know, if we compare A and B together, how many sites of difference do we have? One, two, three, four, five. Um, did I miss one? I should actually have missed one. We should actually have six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I have a total of six differences. If I look, if I compare A and C, that's one difference, that's another difference, that's three differences, you know, that's four, uh, that's five, that's uh, six, and that's seven, okay? So you can do this for all, so I'm not going to do it. So it's basically just pairwise comparison the number of differences. So that's seven, that's five, uh, BC is five, BD is seven and CD is six. And I have to divide that by the number of comparisons. So I have six comparisons. I divide that by the number of six comparisons. And what we actually get is, so if you do that math, that's six. So theta pi in this case is six. So let's now calculate theta s, okay? As theta s is again, you know, the number of segregating sites over, you know, uh, kind of total tree space. So k is equal to one, n minus one. Here, you know, one over k. So here, what is s? S is 11, okay? And how many gene copies do we have? We have four gene copies. So that means that we're going to go from k is equal to one to three, one over k. And that's again, very simple. So it's 11 over, you know, um, basically that's one plus one over two plus one over three. And if you do this, we again, come to six. So again, this actually shows a very nice and very important relationship between uh, each of our free statistics that we kind of developed from the ground up to the stage. So if we have a right Fisher model, so if our model is within our expectation, so no selection, constant population size, no migration out or in uh, to this population, you know, if all of that actually came true, this just means that estimation of theta pi and theta s will actually match each other. So under neutrality, you know, kind of under uh, WF, you know, we know that theta pi should be equal to theta s, okay? So that's, that's one assumption that comes out of all of, you know, coalescent theory that enabled us to actually predict expectations for all of these statistics that we, we, we were using. And this relationship is pretty powerful because it kind of gives us a way to test for deviations away from our expectations. Remember, we drive these expectations because the whole goal is if we know what to expect, then we can actually compare our observations with expectations and if those expect if our expectations and our observations don't match, we can actually deduce that there's something different. So there's something that is violating the right Fisher model that is happening. And again, we can use this if we, you know, sample our kind of genealogies and we calculate theta pi and theta s, and they're not the same, they're really far apart from each other. We can say that, okay, there's something that is uh, kind of violating neutrality here. And again, most of you know, like for example, Tajima's D's test, one of the most famous tests for like selection is actually, you know, based on the quality of this, like the difference between these two is what we test. And if we had time, but I'm kind of out of time, we would have actually seen how selection, how population size actually can modify, can change the allele frequency spectrum, which can actually lead to changes in theta pi and theta s, and we can actually use that for predicting you know, population growth, population decline, selection, and vice versa. But 
suffice to say, I don't really have time. Hopefully this has been useful. Hopefully you've kind of now have a better background of where all of these traditional statistics that we actually use in population genetics or if we use in molecular ecology or you know, kind of evolutionary biology comes from and how, why coalescent theory is really, really important because again, DNA variation along the genome, coalescent theory is the theory that enables us to come with you know, come up with expectations for how that variation would look like. And if we have expectations, then we can actually start, uh, you know, kind of figuring out the factors, which factors violate that and how they violate it and enables us to like test a lot of cool theories in uh, molecular evolution, you know, ev evolutionary biology in general and in molecular ecology. So yeah, thank you. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, uh, if not, yeah, uh, this has been really fun for me, and thank you. Uh, Ismail Ojam, thank you. So